The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Erin Holscher. I'm the Business Development Manager here at ASTA. I'll be the organizer for today's presentation hosted by our partner, the Israel Ministry of Tourism. They're going to be hosting a webinar titled Israel Update, Inspiration and Recovery. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few important features on your screen that will allow you to interact with us. We'll be answering your questions at the end of the presentation. However, please feel, to free, feel free to submit throughout. To ask a question, you'll use the GoToWebinar pane. Near the bottom of this pane is an area that says questions. Next to that area is an arrow, and once you click on that arrow, it will open up a window pane. This is what you'll use to communicate with us. If you're having trouble hearing the presentation, please ensure your speakers are linked, turned on, and if you called in, try hanging up and dialing back in again. You can send me any technical issues via that questions pane, and I'll try to answer them as well. Please also note that all audience members are muted. We certainly want to hear from you, but we have so many people on the call that the background noise would be prohibitive, and we want to ensure that everyone can listen to the entire presentation. Finally, please remember that this webinar is being recorded and available for on-demand viewing at asta.org in just a few short days. Please join me in welcoming today's presenter, Chad Martin. Chad, take it away. Thanks so much, Erin. Uh, and thank you to all of you that have tuned in today or those that may be viewing this uh, in review. Um, we know that Israel is near and dear to so many of your hearts, uh, especially those of you that uh, joined me in 2019, before, long before this conflict was, uh, was at hand. And of course, uh, not so long before everything shut down uh, for COVID. Uh, I know that so many of us were moved on that trip, which I helped to plan uh, with, with my good friend of blessed memory, Bob Duglin. Um, and today, though, obviously the backdrop is not positive. Um, I hope I can take you from an update that is a bit uh, sobering uh, to one that is uh, of hope and, and of thoughts of how we're going to bring Israel back um, on the other side of this issue, on the other side of this uh, conflict. Um, so first things first, for those that do not know me, um, let me change slides here. Uh, I am Chad Martin. I'm the director of the Northeast region for the Israel Ministry of Tourism. Uh, I have served in this role for the last seven years, uh, and I have worked in Israeli tourism, believe it or not, now for over 18 years, uh, or just over 18 years. Uh, and I, I've been starting my conversations uh, about Israel these days uh, very much with my own narrative, because it's really made me reflect on how important tourism is uh, for destinations that are either under duress or have had natural disaster, and how humanizing previous previous uh, trips are when we tell about them. So my first trip to Israel is very much an origin story. I went to Israel for the first time in 1999. Um, I was very much a, a lonely uh, Jewish kid, one of only four Jewish kids in a class of 420 students uh, from a suburb of Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, and I went seeking connection and belonging, and I found it. I found much more than that. Uh, I you know, remember connecting with the desert because it was so different than where I had grown up, um, and connecting with uh, the old city and my ancestry and our long connection with Jerusalem uh, as Jews. But more than that, I remember connecting with so many Israelis and thinking that uh, we were all so similar. And, um, and with that, also noting that in Israeli culture, uh, it's very common to ask someone how they're different and not how they're similar because they want to appreciate your own uh, uniqueness. And that that really stuck and lived with me, you know, for a long time. Um, you know, 1999, obviously, it was a long time ago. I was about 16. Um, and as I went through uh, college, we, of course, uh, encountered as Americans 9-11, which is a lot like what Israel has just encountered. Um, and Israel was in the Intifada, which, you know, I was there during uh, the last time that we had serious peace talks and thought there might be a peaceful resolution. We're hoping that that's at hand very soon here. Um, and I was, I was active in advocating for Israel and, and really uh, went, went back to Israel uh, for about six months in college and fell in love all over again. Um, and then I graduated and I came to New York uh, with this mindset that I would uh, of course, get involved and, and be involved in either politics or all these different things, Israel, and got this job, one of six jobs 
I had in New York City uh, in my first year uh, in Israeli tourism, uh, working for a boutique Israeli tour operator. And I saw people coming back. You know, I think that a lot of us that go to Israel make this connection and we think only we have it with Israel. And I realized that almost every person that was going had an experience like my own. Now, maybe they didn't go on to become a director of the Ministry of Tourism uh, for the Northeast of the U.S., thank God, because then I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have gotten the job. Um, but they all came back changed and inspired and sharing that narrative with their neighbors, with their friends. And uh, this time period has really come to make me appreciate how many people we've brought to Israel uh, in the 18 years. And obviously, I've been, I can't say claim that I've had a hand in all of them, but I'm just so proud of the amount of people that our industry has brought to Israel uh, so that folks can really tell about their own experiences and not make it seem like this place far, far away that has conflict so often. Um, now, unfortunately, in times like these, it also means that they're the ones talking about how awful October the 7th was and how affected they were. Um, but we need that narrative. So many people that had been to Israel, not just students on birthright that go for free, for those of you that know it, it's for, for younger Jewish students, but those that you've sold, uh, those that have come, which is 95% of our tourists reached out to a tour guide or a friend that they went to Israel with or a family that hosted them for dinner to make sure that they were okay. And they re they remembered how normal life is most of the time for Israel. In fact, we've enjoyed relative peace uh, in Israel for the last 10 years, a little bit more than that. Um, and um, a little bit under that, sorry. Uh, so uh, it really humanized the destination for them. And for many of you that, that even joined me on that trip, uh, that we took in 2019. And I think that's just so important. Um, now, as an update, I don't, I don't think I need to tell anyone here about what happened on October the 7th. Um, and I'm also not really gonna delve into the specifics of the conflict with the Hamas government um, that Israel cannot, we just simply cannot have on our border. Um, but I will talk about the people that we're close to in Israel, uh, and that is the Israel tourism industry. Uh, I felt that it was really important that you know how they're doing. Uh, for one, uh, not long after October the 7th, a group got together on WhatsApp and was communicating on how they could get the victims in these, these communities in the South into a place that is more comfortable, like a hotel, um, you know, just so they can relax and have a place that is not this horrific setting uh, that they, where they experienced uh, October the 7th. And many of them are now living in these hotels. Um, our ministry in Israel turned into a logistics center, and you can see a picture of that in the second from the bottom, the, sec the, the right second one down, sorry. Um, they have been finding places for people to stay for those evacuees in the north and the south, you know, almost 300,000 people um, that now are staying in hotels along, around Israel, and, and our, our ministry of tourism has uh, converted into a logistics hub to get them there. Our tour operators have been volunteering, picking fruit for farms where the reservists have been called up. Uh, some of them are reservists themselves. You can see a gentleman in his fatigues um, at the bottom here. That's Yoav Gal. He owns a tour operator by the name of Israel My Way. Um, so it's been a true popular effort to support uh, the entire society, not just the war effort. Yes, the war effort, but uh, the entire society and, and those that have had trauma um, and, and continue to have trauma with their, either their houses being under rocket fire or the brutal attacks of October the 7th. Um, so that was the response of our uh, travel industry initially. Um, and I reiterate that, you know, um, tourism creates stories for travelers that humanize destinations in their home communities when disaster strikes. That's what all the tourists that we've brought in the past have been doing but I've been even more inspired because this is the message I had in early November. Now the message I have is um, an unprecedented aspect of volunteerism, an entire movement of volunteerism that has followed that. Not only were our previous tourists saying their narratives and sharing their experiences in Israel to humanize it for their fellow Americans. And by the way, in the 18 years that I've been doing this, uh, working in some aspect of Israeli tourism, um, about 10 million Americans have traveled to Israel. So that's a, lot of, that's a lot of narratives. But many of those folks are now even saying, you know, this isn't enough. 
I need to get my hands dirty and volunteer too. And it says a lot that one in three of the tourists we would normally have at this time are still coming to Israel despite the current conflict. And that is just so inspiring for us at the ministry. And it also speaks to the meaning in tourism, which is I'm going to visit you, not just you have my support or sending an email or making a phone call, but getting feet boots on the ground, folks that don't even always have relatives or, or close kin or even friends that are in Israel, but that felt so compelled uh, to volunteer. In fact, one of them is a group of cowboys that literally came to help tend farms. Uh, they were from, uh, from the Western United States. Um, in Israel when they saw the, the horrific, horrific attacks of October the 7th. Um, we're getting almost a thousand tourists per day now. Um, so it's truly overwhelming the amount of support. And it also inspires us towards what happens on the other side of this conflict. Um, so uh, with that, I want to move into how we see this playing out whenever the dust is settling. Um, in, in Israel uh, after following um, the operation Swords of Iron. Um, so the first thing I always like to start with is that tourism will return to Israel, and we know that because it always has. Not just in the modern day, but Israel is one of the oldest tourist destinations in the world. Ever since the return after the Babylonian uh, exile about 1,500 years ago, there have been people visiting Israel. And initially, it was Jews that had been, had found lives outside of Israel and went back like we still have today. Um, but since then, it has been uh, Christians that came along a little bit later and, and, and even Muslims and even secular folks uh, that have come to make this very meaningful destination live in their own lives by visiting. Um, so how do we bring it back? You wouldn't be joining this call if you weren't interested in the answer to that. Um, and uh, with myself having so many conflicts behind me, uh, none, none as harrowing as this one, but so many over the years, um, I do think I can shed some light on what to expect and also a little bit about how we can maximize that together as a travel community. Uh, the first thing I will point to is um, Israel is and always will be special. And that means that you can't supplement a trip to Israel. It's not a sunny destination switch with a sunny destination, though we have a lot of sun. It is a unique place that is a nation reborn after 75 years that has the roots of, of the majority of the human population's faith um, all right there in a tiny strip of land the size of New Jersey and so many other aspects to attract people. It will always be in this content that we find our way back to getting people to come because it's baked into the society um, and so much more. Now, looking at it more practically and from maybe a perhaps a more academic standpoint, um, we can let history be our guide. And by that, I mean more modern history. Uh, some may remember in 2014, we did have a conflict um, and it lasted a, a longer time than those that had preceded it, about, about six to eight weeks. Um, it was called Protective Edge. And it, it started similarly with an attack on Israel and Israel needing to respond um, at that time, thinking maybe we could find an equilibrium with Hamas. Um, unfortunately, in the long term, uh, we, we've learned our, our lesson in this case. Uh, but it took about a year. And if you look at this curve here, you can see in 2013, it was starting to pick up. Now, that also reflected the broader travel industry really starting to gain steam in 2013. Um, and that would have continued. But in 2014, we went from a first half of the year that was a record year all the way through June to a second half of the year, which was, was during, about eight weeks during a conflict. The conflict ended around August, uh, mid-August. And then we had a, a relatively quiet uh, uh, fall. Yes, some people came and they came for the Jewish holidays. It wasn't a total lull. Uh, you'd see a real dip if it was in this, in this chart here. Um, and then by December, we had, um, I'd say about a 70% recovery. Finally, that following June of 2015, we were finally back to normal. And that is why you see a flat line there because the second half of that year started to look more like the record year we were having in early 2014. And then in 2016, we see a pickup, which is actually already starting to approach the record. That's how high we were already were uh, of, of tourism. And then 2017, the record was shattered with 3.6 million tourists in Israel. 
Um, 20, by 2019, we had four and a half million tourists in Israel. So almost a million more tourists by then. So you can see that we, we have to anticipate approximately um, you know, a six month uh, uh, recovery period after the cessation of violence. Um, and then we can start expecting to be reaching more of our, closer to the numbers that we used to have uh, in Israel, which, which I think is a miraculous recovery, frankly. And while some may say, yes, but this is a more difficult conflict, that's true, but the market's also changed since 2014. It does recover faster now than it, than it even did before. So that's why I'm, I'm saying that you know, once we have an end uh, to this conflict, we will hopefully have a recovery somewhere between, uh, somewhere around six to, eight, six to 12 months, but, but likely more towards that six month mark because that's what we saw before. Um, so now moving right along, um, I think that many of you have other practical questions for that recovery in um, when we can expect for normal travel products to be available again. Um, one thing that may be a bit of a stumbling block for us in this recovery is not just insurance, which of course is the slides you see right now, but is the availability of the hotels um, with evacuees having um, taken up residence there essentially. And then the longer that goes on, the more wear and tear we'll have. Having spoken to the hoteliers though, Many of them are leaving floors untouched, essentially, or, or for those volunteer groups that I was just speaking about, um, so that the tourists are, are, are have regular tourism wear and tear on those uh, on those sections, and then the areas where people we have evacuees um, that are being accommodated, uh, those are getting the wear and tear, but they're they can be renovated at the same time that the hotel's operational again for normal incoming traffic. Um, and having spoken with the hoteliers, the hope is that. By the time we reach that six month mark I was talking about, they'll have already refreshed any rooms that need to have that problem. So hopefully that cog won't happen with the hotels. Now with insurance, um, I'm not gonna name any names of companies because I've spoken, I, I have spoken to some professionals about it, but I know that many of you have questions. My first thing that I'll say about insurance is if you want really specific answers, speak to your favorite insurer or the ones that you work with. Um, and I'm sure that they will be able to give you more specific answers. But Generally speaking, I can say that right around October the 7th, majority of insurers considered the 7th a terrorist occurrence, which meant that they had 30 days um, to make a claim for their coverage in a 30 day travel period. Some even extended it further on to about uh, 45, 50 days, not quite 60 days uh, to give that coverage for a terrorist act. Because in this case, and in many cases as well, um, there was an act and then there was a war that was declared. Others decided that the war began right after, right after the attacks when Israel declared war uh, on Hamas because of the attacks that um, were um, perpetrated against Israelis on the 7th. Uh, but that's what's happened so far. Now at this point, there aren't gonna be any claims fulfilled because it's, it's now been declared a war zone um, by the State Department, particularly Gaza is considered a war zone, um, but, but broadly, more broadly to Israel, you're not gonna have coverage extended right this moment from them. This is what I've taken from those conversations. Um, but then for coverage to resume, the understanding is that we need a clear end to the violence, um, uh, which, which can take the shape of anything definitive, like a, you know, for instance, a, a, a ceasefire, and then, or, or a peace agreement, or a new government. Um, there's many different possibilities now that we could have uh, in Gaza, but a clear end to hostilities, and then 60 to 90 days after quiet. And the reason for that range is because there's a lot of different ways that this can end, um, and they need to just see definitively that this conflict has come to an end, um, and then also that the State Department no longer defines it as being at war, and then normal coverage can resume again. Um, I know that some folks have that, that question, and, and I hope that that's somewhat addressed uh, what your questions are. If you have specific questions about policies, obviously please direct them to your insurer, but I thought it was important to at least uh, speak to this to some extent. Um, so then moving on from a more practical standpoint of selling Israel again, um, I think that one of the big challenges after this will be getting into Israel yourselves and getting past security. And what I mean by that is um, previously, I had kind of taken a segment out of a lot of my presentations to talk about how to get past the big security question. Um, and Israel's not the only one, but there are these types of destinations where clients will call you 
and say, I want to go to this place and then expect you to convince them that they should go to that place. Uh, maybe it's every destination, I'm not sure. Uh, but I can say for Israel, that's especially true. Um, and when it comes to security, um, and, and ignore the fact that that passport says Mexico on it. Sorry, guys, this is just a stock photo that I used. Um, but when it comes to security, I think the really important thing to address is what we're actually talking about, and it's not security. Most of the time, it's fear. And getting people past fear, in the past, I have always said, is about excitement. It's about talking about all the places that they're gonna see that are so phenomenal. I do think that we'll have more of a challenge now, and my encouragement is, if you have groups and you're dealing with tour leaders, to please tell them to get to Israel themselves so they have that genuine testimonial that they have traveled to Israel after the seventh. Um, so when, when we're on the day after and they wanna lead a trip, they may wanna lead that scouting mission again, which even if they've been to Israel many times, just to tell their group, hey, I was just there and it is safe. It is just as safe as it always was when I was there before. Um, to get, if you're a specialist in selling Israel, get yourself to Israel because that testimonial will be the most salient. Um, as much as I'd love for security to be about statistics and statistically prior to the 7th and prior to our current conflict, uh, Israel was safer than any major US municipality, um, um, humans don't tend to be very logical. It's more about their emotions and how they feel. And we need to really think about how we get them to feel comfortable traveling to Israel again um, on the other side of this. I think a lot of it is getting those testimonials so that you know, getting those um, in, in, impactful visits from people that they know and trust to say Israel is safe for you to travel to um, and start planning your trip now. Um, but we can continue to talk about that as things progress and I'll continue to build out that conversation and examples of it um, prior to uh, our, our cessation of violence and when we really feel like people are ready to come back. Um, so faith-based and spiritual travel will be likely the very fastest recovery um, and most likely market for us to look at. And for those of you that have planned it, you know there's nothing more special than planning uh, a, any journey to Israel, but especially one for uh, strong believer, believers, whether Jewish or Christian, Catholic. Um, it's just a moving place because the stories happened here. Um, and I think it's really important to keep our personal stories near and dear to talk about them, as I did earlier on uh, in this webinar, that uh, it's really important to paint a picture of how special this experience is because that's what's going to get us past the security concern and also just the concern that potentially things could flare up again or um, that, that 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 could get in the way of their trip. Uh, but I, I, I'm just, I'm remiss to, to think about this one fam trip that I led that was before I went on the Destination Expo and one of the advisors that I was with um, I went to uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, and there's a stone of unction there where Jesus's body was prepared. And I saw her immediately get on her knees and weep. And I think about that a lot when I think about talking about the meaning of a trip to Israel and getting people inspired to really think about what they're looking forward to. And that is what the faith-based segment really needs as a nudge to get them back. In many cases, they'll come anyway. In many cases, they'll tell you, I'm going no matter what. But for those that aren't, I think it's really important to remind them of how important a spiritual journey is. Um, additionally, the, the next segment that I think will carry the day is, is uh, multi-generational travel. Now that may be surprising to some because it can be a more, a, a more um, hesitant segment. But the thing about it, particularly for the Jewish uh, community, and a lot of Jewish travel to Israel is multi-generational, is that it's built a lot of times around a bar mitzvah or around a particular grandparent and wanting to get them there with their family um, before, before uh, they, they, their day's number too long. And I think that uh, many of them will be eager because of the pent up demand that even we had during COVID, not everyone made it, uh, that wanted to come uh, to Israel prior uh, to the seventh. And then on top of that, you know, life cycle events like a bar mitzvah that kind of need to happen in a one or two year span. So I think a lot of them will be motivated. And here again, it's, it, it, you almost have to keep reminding them why they're doing the trip um, in order to motivate them to come. Uh, but I do anticipate that a lot of the hotels that cater to this segment will recover quickly 
um, and, and will have accommodations ready when they're ready to come back. And they will really lead the way in, in, um, in the recovery for Israel travel. Um, so, and then lastly, um, I wanted to uh, say that, you know, I've spoken with a lot of the cruise lines and many of them have the same plans to come back to Israel and uh, probably not immediately after because they plan so far out, but I do think that we can anticipate cruise lines returning as early as fall of 2024. Uh, but I think the most important thing is that many cruise lines started traveling out of Haifa um, in the last year and a half following COVID because of the tremendous response they were getting for cruises to do pre-post in Israel. Um, and I've heard nothing saying that those plans have changed because they know that there's a demand for the product. Um, and I think that this recovery will be potentially even led or augmented by the resumption of that travel to Israel because it comes in such big numbers and also because there's an awareness of that demand now among the cruise community. So that is my take on the recovery is that whenever there's a cessation of violence, we will likely have a recovery period of about you know, six months after that moment, um, and then we will be back to normal. That does also require us to have um, a recovery of our airlift, uh, but that looks also to come back. Uh, so far where they're postponing these flights is always within that window that I'm talking about, and that is none of the US carriers are flying to Israel right now. I meant to update you on this earlier, um, but uh, they're all sort of, sort of kicking the can down the road only by about a month or so. Um, on the majority of their flights. So um, by the time we get to that six month window here again, we will have uh, that capacity again, just the same way with the hotels. Uh, so that is my prediction. And we will be relying on all of you, of course, to sell Israel because uh, over half of our travel to Israel from North America is booked by an agent or some kind of intermediary. Um, and a lot of that travel is the type that we're looking after with those tour guides and the wonderful experiences that I was talking about earlier. So I'm reminding you to postpone and don't cancel if you do have book, uh, bookings that are um, already confirmed. And uh, I'm happy to be here for all of you along with all of my colleagues in North America. Um, this is of course our list of uh, directors and we have someone in every major region, uh, New York, LA, Canada, Atlanta and Chicago. Uh, so uh, please do be in touch with us if you have any more specific questions and I'll also be happy to field any questions that have come in that Aaron can, can read now. So at this point, I will pass the mic back to you, Aaron, and um, uh, we look forward to being in touch with you as we orchestrate this recovery. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Chad, for such an informative presentation. We, we got an outpouring of support in the questions section, um, advisors sharing their passion about their previous trips to Israel and about, you know, their, their excitement of continuing to work with, with sending not only groups, but, but um, individuals as well to Israel. So thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you to our advisors who, who jumped on for, for this webinar as well. So to review a few of the questions that came in, um, the, the first one is, what actions can I take to help? What's my best way to connect with a, a reliable organization? Great. So um, it's actually not that hard to find. There, it, it's almost a paradox of choice when it comes to uh, organizations supporting Israel. The first place I always direct people, if they are Jewish, to look at the Jewish Federation locally. Um, there's also the Jewish National Fund has been running um, programs, but there's, you know, what, what we can do is maybe send, uh, the problem is if I start to list them and then I forget one uh, beyond those couple that I just said, um, they will, I will get emails, somehow they will find this webinar and they will say, why didn't you mention my so-and-so group? So what we'll do is maybe as a follow-up, Aaron, we'll send you a, a list of different organizations to help. Certainly funds help. Um, a number of the hospitals have nonprofit branches here. Um, there's a number of uh, centers that are in the south of Israel uh, that service that community that was so affected and, and, and many, of course, died and were, were murdered during the October 7th attacks. Um, but we can send those out uh, as well. And we have a few lists of, of trust organizations that, um, that we would be okay with sharing. Excellent. Thank you. Now, I believe this question might be right along those same lines here. Um, but what information sources should I be connecting with just to stay up to date? Um, 
It's a good question. Um, uh, I, I can say that there are a couple of very good English language uh, is Israeli channels, the Times of Israel, J Post, uh, that are not, that do not charge. Um, so you can use those websites uh, pretty freely. Israel 21C is also a great uh, website that has information about maybe other off the beaten path stories about Israel that you can share in tourism. Um, and then beyond that, here again, uh, we can we can compose a list. But those three are are great ways uh, because, and I'm, I'm saying them because there there's no paywall on them because there are other publications, and I may be reminded of that very soon. Um, but there are Israeli publications that have their own journalists in Israel and are English language. So those are good options. Excellent. And lastly, are there any resources I should make sure my travelers access prior to travel? Um, you know, a, a lot of those resources can be shared by your partner um, and it's itinerary based and things like that. Always do, you know, I'm hesitant to, to, to say check the State Department advisory because it can be so easily misconstrued. You know, Israel prior to this was only a level two, which is this on par with England. And um, but if you if you looked at Gaza itself, it's it's always been a, a high advisory, but that's not where tourists were going. Um, so I, I think that as far as resources go, um, our website, Israel.travel, has a great deal of information on, on logistics and how to travel. Other than that, um, I, I think that uh, just staying up to date and checking either of those two publications is always a good idea, the, the J-Post or, or uh, Times of Israel. Um, here again, uh, we, can, we can try to compile some more information for them. Feel free also to send them to Tel Aviv Global. Um, and uh, also um, uh, JDA, which is our Jerusalem. Uh, those are our two CVBs. Um, we have a whole list of the different local um, is uh, the, the local tourist boards in Israel, our CVBs, on our website that you can also reach. So the Negev, the North, and those can be useful resources just for inspiration. Um, but I, I think that I, I hesitate because sometimes there's just too much caution thrown out there um, or too much alarm on some of those sites, uh, which uh, I, I would, we wouldn't send anyone to harm's way, but they may say, oh, well, Gaza's dangerous, Israel's dangerous, that they're not the same place. No, thank you so much for the, for the, the clarification and this information. And again, this, this access to continuing information. So um, I know this slide that you have up right now is gonna be a vital resource to be able to, to stay informed and then to be able to also continue um, to inform clients as, as a trusted travel advisor. So that, yeah. that does conclude our, our Q&A session here for this afternoon. Now, as I mentioned, this webinar was recorded. So if you'd like to listen to the presentation, again, it will be available to ASTA.org, uh, excuse me, to ASTA members on ASTA.org in just a few short days. So thank you so much to our partners at the Israel Ministry of Tourism and all of you who have joined us for today's webinar. Chad, anything to add as you send this out? Um, I just want to thank the entire travel industry for the outpour of support that we've received. Um, it's just unprecedented and uh, just know that we appreciate you and um, and I know that so many destinations right now are looking forward, Israeli and so many destinations are looking forward to working with you to help recover on the heels of this. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chad. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your afternoon.